I'm Zach Miller of Minitex, and I'm here with Dan Cohen, the founder and director of the Digital Public Library of America. Uh, he was our keynote speaker today at the uh, Minnesota Digital Library's 12th annual meeting. Thanks for coming, Dan. It's great to be here. <laughs> so for people that weren't able to make it to the meeting, what was the big highlight or takeaway that you'd like to communicate to them? Well, I think the biggest takeaway really is that DPLA is a collaboration. And what I talked a lot about today, and we heard it in other sessions as well, is that there are many ways to get involved with the DPLA. There's material from around the state of Minnesota that has been put into the DPLA, and we're driving traffic and eyeballs back out to that. But really, more on a human level, we really saw, I think, today that there's so many people in the state who are interested in getting involved, and there are many ways to do that, from becoming a DPLA community rep, to serving on one of our advisory committees, to really getting involved with something major like Minnesota Digital Library, where it really is in the action of creating the DPLA, creating the aggregation, um, really one day at a time. So it was exciting to be here and to uh, witness everything going on. <laughs> so when you think about DPLA uh, tomorrow, what's the real future that you're excited sure. about? And what's the dreamed future that you're even more excited about? Right, spaceships, things like that, jetpacks. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think, first of all, we, we still have a lot of work. I think the, the real future in the next couple of years will be about uh, doing what I like to call completing the map, which is uh, making sure that we have an on-ramp like the Minnesota Digital Library in every state in the Union. Right now, we only cover about 15 states. Um, and uh, so we need to bring on 35 more states and make sure that they have what we call service hubs or places like Minnesota Digital Library that they can go through to get their content into the DPLA. So I think we'll be spending a lot of the next two or three years on that. Um, we'll also be spreading out and thinking about different kinds of item types, gaps that we have in our collection to really ensure that we have uh, the full range of human expression in the DPLA. So, I think that's part of it. I think in our dream jetpack scenario, <laughs> actually a lot of what I talked about today was DPLA as a platform, which is often not talked about as much as a, let's say, aggregation of library content. And I think we're seeing some really exciting things going on and some um, maybe hints of the future in the way that people are really getting creative, software developers, educators, um, others who are using the data and the content from DPLA to really dream up completely new apps from iPhone apps to integrating DPLA material um, across the globe. Um, we, I pointed out today that there's a, a, an exhibit on the First World War that uh, is produced by Europeana, um, which are our, our sister project in Europe, and uh, it incorporates DPLA content, and that's really exciting um, because it means that we're really bootstrapping into a global digital library. So that's an exciting future that we all have to look forward to. So not necessarily jetpacks, but still very exciting. <laughs> yes, we will. We'll leave the jetpacks to uh, Google, maybe, and uh, other other uh, places. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, serendipity during yes. your talk yep. and the importance yep. of serendipity and sure. uh, the ability of people to come to DPLA and uh, discover really valuable stuff, sort of accidentally. Yes. You can talk a little bit more about that. You know, this is such an important theme for me because I think that. Um, in our transition from an analog world where you know we really had the pleasure of browsing bookshelves and, and almost literally physically bumping into things. Um, same is true in archives. I'm a very traditionally trained historian. I literally would bump into things. I would open up boxes in archives in Europe and the United States and, and find new things, <laughs> find new letters. That notion of serendipity and how we bring that online, I think in an age where we're just doing keyword searches, it's almost a little bit too targeted and there's not a, a lot of fuzziness to it where we might bump into things at the edges. And so one of the things that DPLA is trying to do with our interfaces and through our partnerships is to have different kinds of material adjacent to each other online and you know get into your visual um, realm. Uh, I gave one example where we have books side by side with visual culture, artworks, and photographs. And so that's a way for the student, the teacher, the advanced researcher to really bump into things and to have a serendipitous discovery of something that they normally wouldn't find online. Hmm. It sounds like a way for people to spend more time than they intended on the internet, oh, yeah. <laughs> but in a productive way. Yes, no, we are happy to have people spend hours and hours on the DPLA site, and uh, I think browsing is really exciting. I think uh, I think that um, there's there's something in the DPLA for everyone, and there's really extensive holdings in a variety of areas where there's amateur enthusiasts, not just professional historians like me, um, to find interest there. So we're we're happy to have everyone um, take a look. Go to dp.la and see what's in our holdings. 
So last question for you, sure. Dan. Um, as you know, the Minnesota Digital Library is now administratively housed within Minitex, yeah. um, and we're all about libraries at Minitex. And yes. of course, libraries are about a lot more than books, but I still yeah. would love to know, uh, what's the best book that you've read <laughs> recently, or what are you reading now? Oh my gosh, that <laughs> is a fantastic question. Um, what is the best book I have read recently? Um, I'm going, this is going to... I'm trying to think what I have right now on my iPad. Um, let's see. Well, I vary between um, fiction and nonfiction. Um, I recently read Robin Sloan's book, which I highly recommend, his first novel called um, Mr. Penumbra's 24-Hour Bookstore, which anyone who is interested in libraries <laughs> should absolutely read about this all-night bookstore that has curious, um, potentially UFO-like properties um, to it. Um, and uh, on the uh, nonfiction side, I'm currently reading a book, um, this may be of slightly less interest, on the history of accounting. I am a professional oh historian, and I'm interested in things related to numbers. I wrote a history of 19th century math, so I'm sure everyone watching this video now is very excited. But uh, there's a great new book by Jacob Soule, um, which is about the origin of the spreadsheet, es essentially the origin of the spreadsheet and accounting. Um, and um, and the profit and loss statement, and he makes an incredible argument that it led to uh, many revolutions and, and interesting things. Um, Jake is a, 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 a terrific historian at um, U, uh, UCLA, and uh, did I get that right? Or USC? USC, um, and uh, really brilliant um, scholar of, of early modern and modern history. So I, <laughs> if, you, if you're interested in that, uh, you can Google Jacob Soul's um, history. Well, if we didn't uh, know it before, we <laughs> definitely know now that you are not a one-dimensional person. <laughs> no, I think actually I do have three dimensions. <laughs> it is great to be here in person. I do so much digitally that um, you know, it, is, it, it is nice. I'm a gregarious person. It's great to talk to people live. It's great to be, talk to people via video. And uh, so I'm not just all on Twitter or via email. <laughs> and uh, it's wonderful to be here in Minnesota and to uh, have a chance to talk to you and your colleagues. All right. Well, thanks again for coming, Dan. Great. Thanks so much.